Good morning. Um, our webinar this morning, as uh, Penny said, is going to be looking at energy from waste. We'll dive straight in. Just a quick intro about uh, the Carbon Trust. Uh, we are a not-for-profit organization or with a mission to accelerate the move to a sustainable and low-carbon economy. Um, we support this on the under uh, three areas, we offer out um, advice to businesses, governments, um, and the public s sector as to the opportunities that are there. Um, we offer footprinting advice, where we uh, measure and certify the environmental footprint of organisations, and also we offer uh, technology, where we um, help to d develop and to deploy low carbon technologies and solutions. Waste, um, the amount of waste that's uh, created by um, industry um, in the UK obviously has a significant impact on um, the overall production efficiency. Um, it's clear then that the less you, you waste, um, the higher the efficiency of the process. If you're able to usefully utilise this waste, um, then you, you, you can have a, a profound impact um, on your business efficiency. It's worth noting, however, before we go on, that it's always going to be more efficient to produce less waste in the first place than obviously to, to try and recuperate it um, after the fact. Um, this applies to uh, the use of uh, raw materials um, as well as uh, processes that are poorly uh, set up in the first place. Uh, that there are plenty of opportunities to, to pursue um, and that these will all uh, attract the support of uh, the Green Business Fund. So we'll go in and look, uh, see if we can help identify the likely waste streams that you would have that could be used. Um, I've, uh, I've broken these down into, into three broad areas um, under manufacturing. Um, you're going to be looking for waste that you're otherwise sending to landfill or to drain. So that could be the wood and uh, sawdust from, say, furniture or pallet manufacturers or from sawmills or where a business uses quite a lot of transport crates as well that create a, a wood waste. Um, but you've also got effluent streams as well, and they would be prevalent in food manufacturers and also in uh, farm slurries. Um, also looking at the areas under forestry and agriculture, so you'd be thinking about maybe harvesting waste and sawmill, residue, straw, husk, etc. And grouping those two areas t t together, I've, I've put them under the banner of biomass. Um, but looking more sp specifically then at, at, at processes, um, there are uh, there are opportunities under uh, like sort of flue gas streams, um, steam systems, uh, waste heat from compressed air, um, and of course ovens and extracts from the likes of tunnel kilns as well. So. Those are the kind of those kind of areas that you want to um, uh, try to think about um, as to where the opportunities are. So we'll look in, in a little more detail, uh, and we'll look at the opportunity for biomass in the first place. Um, we'll start off with the dry waste, if you will. So as we said, um, sources are going to be uh, furniture manufacture or agriculture or forestry, and I'm, I'm sure there's going to be a range of other ones in there as well. Um, but it's basically um, biomass is that, that kind of waste stream. You're looking for a fuel that can be either be burned as it is um, in a uh, you know in a, in, um, in a wood burner, or more typically it would be uh, Chipped um, and used in a bespoke uh, biomass boiler. Typically, it's used to produce heat, um, which is either used in the process or for heating. Um, but it can also be 
uh, used to raise steam to generate uh, electricity, but that, that's usually limited to the larger plants. It can also be used in gasification and paralysis to generate um, a gas source, but um, the technologies for those aren't, aren't uh, fully commercialized yet. Um, it's worth noting as well under the requirements um, imposed on on uh, on how you use the fuel under the waste incineration directive as well. Um, the things that you need to be thinking about if if you want to look at uh, using your waste as a biomass, there will be an additional space requirement for shipping. Um, you're going to need to build a stockpile of the fuel, obviously, so you're going to need to have some storage as well. Um, and non-virgin sources of, of wood, they need to be certified um, to qualify for the renewable heat incentive. Economics, broadly, um, because you're utilizing a waste stream, it means that the, uh, the economics are highly dependent, obviously, on the displaced fuel cost and if you have unavoided waste disposal charges as well. Um, but typically for going to be the area that you're looking at under the two megawatt uh, thermal, uh, just, to, just roughly 200 to the 450 uh, pounds per kilowatt. Um, typical paybacks that we would be seeing for projects coming through would be under usually about three, under three years. But again, that's very dependent and usually is uh, down to dis um, uh, the re reduction in um, the waste charges. So have a think, if you do have a suitable uh, waste stream then it would be worth um, taking the project forward. Also worth noting that while you may not have enough of your own uh, waste fuel, you could have other businesses uh, around you that that it has, um, and that, that could also uh, generate a useful income stream. I've seen a few projects that would have that would have um, gone down that route as well. But it's also worth remembering that you do need to have this the space as well. So I've I've termed here the uh, wet waste biomass. For those you're talking about, t typically those are this, uh, the effluent streams for the food manufacturers, farms, slurries, uh, kitchen and garden waste as well can be used. These would be uh, typically you would use a couple of, of, of streams in the anaerobic uh, digestion process. Um, to you know to uh, to generate the gas uh, from that the process itself is driven by bacteria um, which break down the the uh, those uh, waste streams uh, in the absence of um, oxygen and it produces uh, a highly concentrated uh, methane gas uh, the waste streams are fed into a digester where the bacteria is um, the process takes place you draw off the biogas and um, you can use that in a variety of ways, either um, you can compress it and use it as a vehicle fuel or pass it through the turbine to get um, combined heat and power um, or just uh, simply through an ordinary gas burner um, to drive the process or generate steam. The yield, as you can imagine, is uh, very dependent on what feedstock you have. Um, you get a the, you get a higher yield from food waste um, rather rather than the slurry. So um, you can see the potential uh, yields from feedstock um, there as well. Economics, it's not cheap, um, and these are tend to be quite. Uh, large projects. There's a lot of uh, civil work that needs to be done. You do need a lot more space. But if you have a waste stream, um, and again, if others, other businesses close by have, then it could be worth having to think about it. It's because if you do have the space and the waste stream, then um, the returns are good, but they are a longer term project um, and tend to be um, tend to be more 
more used to as a waste avoidance um, in a way as opposed to j j just a straight energy project. So we go into the the the, the more process um, end of uh, looking to waste heat recovery. So obviously it's in the processes um, there is a typically a lot of um, heat that is uh, generated, so you can think about um, flue gases, the vapour from processes as well, um, also to think about like, like, um, the radiant losses from equipment, so like um, the ovens or compressors. Um, if you're using cooling water as well, and um, that can be a, a uh, useful stream. Um, and if you're providing chilled water, also the, the actual products that are being made as well, there's there's a lot of heat stored in them. Um, other things to think about then would be the gaseous or um, liquid effluent from the processes. So those are the those are the areas where you want to kind of concentrate your uh, thinking in terms of uh, wanting to identify um, where sources of heat could be found. So obviously in terms of the SME sector then the greatest opportunity is going to be found in the mid temperature to low temperature range. So in terms of um, your steam boilers, you're looking around the, the 300 degree mark, um, likes of furnaces and ovens similarly, um, but more probably more popular um, areas are certainly the areas where we would see that the majority of the projects would be down in the in the low range, so um, likes of process steam or, or uh, cooling water from injection molding, um, also some good projects to be had around the refrigeration uh, condensers um, and also the uh, low temperature chiller condensers, but we'll come on to the um, individual projects in a in a second or two. So in terms of your uh, your steam boiler, as you'll know, um, in the in the steam cycle, the condensate will come back um, into the boiler house and be fed um, into the boiler again at about around 90 degrees. Um, there's a significant amount of energy used then just to raise that up into uh, to become useful steam. Again, um, as such, uh, if you're able to preheat that up to a higher temperature before introducing it into the boiler, then there are some good savings to be had. Um, they do that using a economizer, um, and in this example, it's a non-condensing one, so that would be used typically in a oil boiler because uh, you don't want um, you don't want any of the vapor from the uh, from the oil to condense um, into a liquid because it's highly acidic and it'll it'll uh, rot the back end um, out of the boiler. Um, the use of economizers are more common for the larger boilers, but they are suitable for for most um, that would be used in industry. The typical applications that you can use the recovered heat for is obviously um, heating the boiler makeup water, um, as I've said, but I've also seen some ones uh, successfully used for um, generating um, hot water as well. You can expect to see fuel savings in the order of about 4 to 6 percent as well. Um, there are also the uh, the condensing, uh, but you would uh, limit these to uh, gas boilers. But there are there are there are um, significant additional savings of around five percent, uh, and you would see those in the likes of the uh, leisure centres and hospitals, and again for large hot water users. Another quite uh, simple uh, project that can be carried out um, in the boiler house um, in most you're drawing uh, the air um, through the burner um, at the temperature at, at just the ordinary ambient um, temperature, usually the temperature 
of the boiler house, but if you're able to preheat that air, um, then you're taking out uh, some of the work um, that, or some of the heat that uh, has to be put into it um, via uh, the gas or the oil. Um, the usual way that that is done um, is to duct the warm air from the highest point in the boiler house. It's surprisingly simple, um, but uh, there are savings there to be had, which you know, by just raising the temperature to the likes of 20 degrees, you're going to 1% saving. Um, you may have to check though that the that the burner um, is or the uh, the force draft fan is capable of overcoming the um, additional back pressure um, that's caused by the ducting, but that's well worth doing. The blow down heat recovery on a on a on a steam boiler it's very much a, a kind of a project for the for the larger scale steam boiler may not be um, wholly applicable to today's audience but um, if if you operating a boiler around or over the one megawatt mark then it is you should be looking um, at installing the blowdown heat recovery if you haven't already got it um, on the system but again there are some good savings to be had it depends on whether the blowdown is intermittent or whether it's well controlled and is a continuous process but there's you know, there's there's savings to be had there if, um, up to almost uh, four percent and um, again it would be a common recommendation that we would make uh, during our audits but I think uh, less and less now um, when we went to boiler houses um, you it would be less common to see um, the systems that that hadn't got the uh, blow down heat recovery on them. A lot of uh, refrigeration processes going on for likes of uh, food production and storage. Refrigeration process um, is fundamentally is um, extracting heat from one space, concentrating it and then re rejecting it in another. Um, this heat is rejected at the condenser um, and obviously it's here where there's the opportunity to recover some of that. You'll find um, particular in this example where it's um, high grade heat um, so that would be probably chilling to quite a low temperature. Um, you can get uh, temperatures um, at the D superheater of um, 60 to 90 degrees, um, so you would install a um, heat exchanger at that to uh, to extract that heat before um, it goes to the condenser. And it's obviously if if it's installed in a new system, then the efficiencies are going to be considerably higher than as a retrofit. But you're still looking at 30% um, of that um, heat can. Um, can be uh, recovered with a with a uh, retrofit option as well. Um, I'm still surprised at the number of uh, food manufacturers that I would have audited that have quite quite extensive uh, refrigeration systems where they aren't doing this, and yet they will have a high demand for the hot water in their cleaning processes. So there's also a significant opportunity for heat recovery um, from refrigeration but at the lower temperatures. The typical systems in the UK um, you'll have heat at the condensers um, between 20 degrees and 40 degrees so they're systems that obviously aren't cooling to you know minus 40 degrees or something. You know, these are these are um, these are smaller plants, um, but still that heat that that's being rejected can be used for um, other heating purposes. The simplest uh, form is uh, is to um, take the air 
um, from across the condenser and feed that into a space where the, the heat um, is required. Um, I'm actually looking at a project at the minutes, it's a, a plastics factory, um, and they have got extensive c cooling, um, obviously for the extrusion process. They've they've added another um, manufacturing facility uh, onto their current and are looking to utilize the uh, the heat that they're rejecting from the process to um, to provide this PS heating. Um, it's a great project. Very simple, um, and it's very, quite cost effective. Um, you may re require an additional fan, obviously, um, but that you know that that's that's fairly common. Um, the other way, I suppose, if the if where the heat is required is 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 uh, further away from the plant, then your option is to either move the condenser closer or you can use a pumped water system to get that heat and from where it's being produced to where it's required. Typically in supermarkets, um, kind of to the medium to large scale, uh, they can produce up to 80% of their hot water requirement um, by recovering the heat from their refrigeration systems. Again, still on the uh, low-grade um, waste heat recovery. Um, a lot of businesses, a lot of industries are heavily reliant on compressed air. They are exiting um, at the compression stages, obviously, usually well above 80 degrees. Again, it depends on, on what uh, what pressure you're, you're generating to. Um, but this air has to be cooled. Um, normally, that cooling that that air um, is typically being um, allowed to dissipate the atmosphere when in most cases uh, 25 to 85 percent of that electrical energy that has gone in um, to compressing there can be recovered in the form of heat. Um, I've s seen that used extensively for space heating similar to the low-grade refrigeration heat recovery. Um, it can be used for the generation of, of hot water for uh, the food industry, that would be common, um, or for preheating the boiler feed. Um, there's a, there's, there's a, a variety of uses for it. Um, the project is, is simple insofar as you're, you're s simply deducting the air um, into, from from the compressor to the space that you want to heat. Obviously, um, you need to put a bypass on it for uh, when the heat isn't required. That would uh, typically, obviously, be during the summer. Again, we talked earlier about the economizer, which is a fancy name for heat exchanger. Again, tend to be on the larger boilers, so they're going to be a little bit more expensive. But in terms of the project payback, that you get, again, depending on the run hours of the boiler, um, they can pay back very, very quickly. Um, again, the uh, capital contribution on this was um, um, helped to reduce the, uh, the payback by a few months also. Snack Foods manufacturer, um, they utilized their waste vegetable oil um, from the cooking process and they fed that into a generator. Need to be careful with the legs of that uh, food uh, or uh, vegetable oil um, as, the, as, the, uh, as the combustion um, process can be quite acidic so you need to change the bearings on the um, on the engine um, are quite specialized um, otherwise they begin to deteriorate quite quickly but that was a worthy um, project for them to pursue with um, annual savings of just under 70,000. They they were obviously using the engine to drive a generator. Again, good project payback um, and a waste stream avoided. And another smaller project that came through for the dairy farmer, they were um, 
having to have to cool the milk uh, fairly rapidly so um, there's a good uh, supply of, of, of heat from the condenser. They were able to use that to um, for generating hot water for cleaning. Um, good project savings for uh, for a relatively modest capital cost but um, again that was a good and uh, worthy project to pursue. And a larger food manufacturer then with uh, 200 kilowatts of chilling, so, so fairly big. Again, they were uh, installing heat recovery and then using the, the heat in a, a uh, separate part of the business. Um, and they were able to apply for the capital contribution, which was able to help to reduce the payback from just, just under two years um, to uh, 1.3. So there are good opportunities to be had. Um, hopefully that's that's given you some things to think about. Um, when you do identify a project, then the Green Business Fund um, is here to offer support um, and guidance. Um, it's a scheme obviously operated by the Carbon Trust. Um, its idea is to contribute uh, to improved sustainability and energy efficiency. It's for small to medium businesses in England, Scotland um, and Wales. Um, it's got a limited time scale. So if you have projects and you're wanting that kind of support, then um, you need to be thinking about acting as soon as you can. Um, it provides a combination of advice, training, direct contribution uh, for the purchase of capital equipment. So, I said it's available in England, Scotland, and Wales for small to medium enterprises, but also includes uh, schools, sole traders, and charities. And there's a quite specific uh, definition of what the GBF defines as an SME. But if you're if you're able to tick any two of the criteria, then you will qualify. There's also the offer of opportunity assessments. These can be either remote or we can visit your site. Um, it depends on how high your energy spend is. Um, it would be one of our, our own um, engineers you would visit and we would look to identify the top three recommendations um, and then uh, help you take the next steps to actually implementing um, and these are obviously available to the SMEs um, in those regions as we outlined. There's also uh, implementation advice, so where you typically, this would be where you have a project that you are wanting um, to take forward, we can, we can offer out um, up to five days of support um, we're ready to have one of our um, engineers to uh, assist you with that obviously again it's, it's it's really for companies that have gone have gone through their technical and financial due diligence um, of the project and and are just wanting our our help with uh, the, the likes of drawing up the, drawing up the tender documentation or also to think of as as well is to um, the equipment that you're going to be installing. It's well worth um, ensuring that it is listed on the energy technology list. Um, organizations that pay income or corporation tax can then claim an enhanced capital allowance on the purchase of that equipment provided it's on the ETL list. So means that you can get a tax benefit in the year of purchase. So if your organization is going to be spending £10,000 on ETL equipment, then that could be £2,000 um, return. The Carbon Trust also has got um, the Green Business Directory. Um, this is a list of uh, accredited suppliers. Um, who have who have applied to us to be um, on the directory? Um, they've gone through a reasonable 
um, assessment to check the quality um, uh, of the work that they do. We also do a financial check on them and they go through an interview process as well. So if you're looking to install any equipment or renewable technology then, then um, it's a good place to start. It's all online um, can be searched uh, by region and obviously by technology. Um, let's say it's uh, free to use. Um, using a supplier from the Green Business directly as well will then allow you to gain access to the Green Business Fund um, at the same time. So we have a couple of questions that have come through. The first one comes from Ratna Prasal and they are asking was the avoided cost of energy, heat and electricity from biogas from CHP taken into account in the wet biomass payback scenario? Uh, yes, it was, yes. Okay, next question comes from Bridget Bradley and she's asked, can you recommend insulation for a 30-year-old powder paint oven that is giving rise to a lot of waste heat that is resulting in very uncomfortable conditions in the summer, please? The waste heat is not needed. Hmm. Um, well, I mean, certainly uh, the insulation will help with that. Um, I can't offer out a, a name um, of a company that would help with that, but um, you could look on uh, look on the Green Business Directory uh, website um, for uh, suppliers that um, that will be able to um, supply that to you. I don't think we've got any further questions, so um, we'll wrap up on behalf of the Carbon Trust. I'd like to thank you for joining us today and hope you enjoy the rest of your day.